whether it manifests as an unquenchable thirst for wealth, possessions, or influence, greed emerges as a formidable force capable of distorting the very essence of human interaction. At its core, greed embodies the relentless pursuit of accumulation, be it of food, money, land, or power. It thrives on the premise of acquisition, driving individuals to amass more than they could ever need or utilize. This insatiable appetite knows no bounds, consuming everything in its path and leaving little room for contentment or satisfaction. Yet, greed extends beyond mere materialism. It encompasses a desire for social value as well. Status, recognition, and authority become coveted prizes in the eyes of the greedy, fueling a perpetual cycle of comparison and competition. Throughout the annals of history, greed has emerged as a universally condemned trait recognized for its detrimental impact on both individuals and societies at large. It breeds inequality, exacerbating disparities between the affluent and the impoverished. It fosters corruption, corroding the foundations of justice and integrity. It incites conflict, pitting individuals and nations against one another in a relentless pursuit of dominance. Moreover, greed engenders a profound conflict between personal desires and societal well-being. While it promises fulfillment and prosperity on an individual level, its pursuit often comes at the expense of collective harmony and cohesion. The relentless pursuit of material gain blinds individuals to the interconnectedness of human existence, fostering a culture of selfishness and indifference. The nuanced relationship between greed, self-interest, and societal development has long captivated the minds of economists, philosophers, and social theorists alike. While self-interest is often portrayed as a rational pursuit of one's own well-being within the bounds of ethical conduct, greed transcends these boundaries, exhibiting a voracious appetite for accumulation at any cost. Early economic thinkers grappled with the distinction between self-interest and greed, recognizing that while the former may serve as a driving force for innovation and productivity, the latter poses a threat to the very fabric of society. Adam Smith often heralded as the father of modern economics, acknowledged the role of self-interest in promoting economic prosperity, but warned against the unchecked pursuit of wealth for its own sake. As the 19th century unfolded, influenced by the philosophical ideas of Hegel, a growing chorus of voices within the economic and political sphere began to denounce greed as a corrosive force that hindered social progress. It became increasingly evident that societies could not thrive in an environment rife with unchecked greed, where the pursuit of individual gain came at the expense of communal well-being. John Maynard Keynes, a towering figure in 20th century economics, underscored the inherent conflict between private and social interests, highlighting the divergence between individual motives and the broader interests of society. His assertion that the world is not governed in such a way that these interests always align remains a poignant reminder of the inherent tensions within economic systems. Max Weber's insights into the integration of avarice within the spirit of capitalism shed light on the complex interplay between economic ideology and moral values. By infusing utilitarian principles with the philosophy of greed, capitalism became not just an economic system but a moral framework that valorized the accumulation of wealth. Within this paradigm, wealth itself was not inherently unethical. Rather, it was the manner in which it was acquired and utilized that determined its ethical standing. Weber's examination of the Protestant ethic further elucidates this nuanced perspective on wealth and greed. According to Weber, the Protestant ethic viewed wealth as morally neutral, with its ethical implications hinging upon the intentions and actions of the individual. Wealth obtained through diligent labor and frugality was deemed virtuous serving as evidence of one's industriousness and God's favor. Conversely, wealth acquired for the sole purpose of indulgence and leisure was condemned as sinful, reflecting a lack of moral discipline and a disregard for worldly responsibilities. From a secular psychological standpoint, greed is conceptualized as an insatiable desire to acquire or possess more than what is necessary for one's well-being. It transcends mere materialism encompassing a perpetual dissatisfaction with one's current possessions or status. Eric Fromm pointedly described greed as a bottomless pit that consumes individuals in a ceaseless quest for fulfillment, yet remains perpetually unfulfilled. Psychological research supports the notion of greed as a measurable personality trait, 
with individuals exhibiting varying degrees of susceptibility to its allure. Studies have linked greed to financial behaviors such as excessive spending, borrowing, and saving, highlighting its profound impact on economic decision-making. Moreover, greed has been implicated in unethical conduct, as individuals driven by avarice may prioritize personal gain over ethical considerations. Crucially, the pursuit of greed has been shown to exert a detrimental influence on overall well-being, fostering feelings of dissatisfaction and disconnection. While the accumulation of wealth may provide temporary gratification, it ultimately fails to satisfy the deeper human need for meaning and fulfillment. In this sense, greed emerges not only as a moral failing but also as a profound existential quandary, challenging individuals to confront the true sources of human flourishing. The portrayal of greed in literature often extends beyond human characters to encompass animals, reflecting a deep-seated recognition of similar behavioral patterns across species. Animal fables and observations offer poignant insights into the primal instincts that drive creatures to prioritize self-interest and consumption. One classic example is the dog in the manger trope, derived from Aesop's fables, which depicts a dog lying in a manger full of hay, refusing to let other animals eat from it even though it has no use for the hay itself. This archetype serves as a metaphor for individuals who hoard resources out of selfishness, denying others access to them. Similarly, pigs are often used as symbols of greed due to their voracious appetites and tendency to consume excessively. Their insatiable hunger and willingness to gorge themselves until satiated parallel human behaviors associated with gluttony and excess. The wolverine, with its scientific name gullo gullo meaning glutton, serves as a particularly vivid example of greed in the animal kingdom. Known for its outsized appetite and aggressive behavior, the wolverine exhibits a propensity for consuming large quantities of food in a single sitting. However, rather than simply satisfying its hunger, the wolverine often goes further by spoiling any remaining food, leaving little for other scavengers or future consumption. The ancient world teems with narratives and philosophies that dissect the perils of greed, spanning diverse cultures and traditions. In classical Greek thought, the concept of pleonexy, or an unjust desire for the possessions or advantages of others, emerges as a recurring theme in the works of luminaries such as Plato and Aristotle. The panhellenic disapproval of greed finds vivid expression in mythological tales, such as the punishment inflicted upon Tantalus. Condemned to eternal torment in the underworld, Tantalus is depicted as perpetually reaching for fruit and water that recede from his grasp, symbolizing the futility of insatiable desire. This myth serves as a potent allegory for the consequences of unrestrained greed, wherein one's cravings remain forever unfulfilled, leading to perpetual dissatisfaction and suffering. In the annals of Roman history, the demise of the Republic is often attributed to the insatiable greed for wealth and power among its political elite. Writers such as Sallust, Plutarch, and Cicero lament the moral decay that accompanies the relentless pursuit of personal gain, pointing to figures like the Gracchi brothers as exemplars of the pernicious influence of avarice on political life. Across the expanse of the Persian empires, the Zoroastrian demon Azi Dahaka stands as a fearsome embodiment of unquenchable desire. With its three heads symbolizing the multifaceted nature of greed, Azi Dahaka serves as a cautionary figure in Persian folklore, reminding individuals of the dangers of succumbing to unchecked appetites. In the Dharma Shastras of ancient India, greed is identified as the root cause of immorality, echoing the sentiments expressed in the laws of Manu. This seminal text underscores the pivotal role of loba, or greed, in perpetuating moral decay and social discord, urging individuals to cultivate virtues of contentment and self-restraint. Early Chinese texts, such as the Shai Jian Jing and the Zhuizhuan, warn of the malevolent influence of the greedy Taotai, one of the four perils that beset gods and mortals alike. Through allegorical tales and moral parables, these texts caution against the dangers of succumbing to base desires, which threaten to undermine the harmony of the cosmos. In the oral traditions of North American indigenous peoples, bears are often cast as symbols of greed, representing a formidable threat to communal harmony. These tales serve as cautionary reminders of the importance of sharing and cooperation within tribal societies, countering the destructive impulses of selfishness and acquisitiveness.
Similarly, allegorical literature from various cultures personifies greed through figures like the fox, whose cunning and rapaciousness serve as cautionary tales for readers of all ages. The historical stigmatization of greed as a racial pejorative by ancient Greeks and Romans reflects a broader trend of using cultural differences to vilify perceived enemies or outsiders. Egyptians, Punics, and other Oriental peoples were often targeted with accusations of greed, their customs and practices deemed strange or morally inferior by the dominant Mediterranean civilizations. By the late Middle Ages, this derogatory stereotype had become increasingly associated with Jews, who were frequently scapegoated for economic hardships and societal tensions. In religious texts, the condemnation of greed resonates as a universal moral imperative, transcending cultural boundaries and theological traditions. The commandments outlined in the books of Moses, central to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, explicitly prohibit theft and covetousness, emphasizing the sanctity of property and the dangers of unrestrained desire. These foundational precepts serve as ethical guideposts for believers across diverse faith communities, fostering a collective commitment to principles of justice and integrity. Within Islamic teachings, the Quran admonishes against wastefulness and extravagance, warning believers against squandering resources heedlessly. Simultaneously, it encourages responsible stewardship of wealth and resources, cautioning against the allure of materialism and ostentation. In the Christian Gospels, the teachings of Jesus echo similar themes, urging his followers to guard against the seductive allure of greed and material possessions. His admonition to watch out and be vigilant against all forms of greed highlights the insidious nature of this vice, which threatens to ensnare individuals in a cycle of endless desire and dissatisfaction. Moreover, Jesus emphasizes the transient nature of worldly wealth, asserting that true fulfillment lies not in material abundance but in spiritual wholeness and moral integrity. In the comedic satire Plutus by Aristophanes, the relentless pursuit of wealth is humorously portrayed as an insatiable appetite that knows no bounds. The Athenian character, along with his slave, unabashedly declares to Plutus, the god of wealth, that while other desires may wane over time, the desire for wealth only intensifies with each acquisition. This sentiment reflects the cynical view of human nature, highlighting the perpetual dissatisfaction inherent in the pursuit of material riches. Roman poet Lucretius delves into the psychological underpinnings of greed, identifying the fear of death and poverty as primary motivators behind this insatiable desire. He contends that the relentless pursuit of wealth leads individuals to transgress moral boundaries, resorting to crime and corruption in their quest for power and security. Lucretius paints a grim picture of the corrosive effects of greed on societal order and individual morality, warning of its potential to undermine the fabric of civilization. Epictetus, a Stoic philosopher, echoes these sentiments, admonishing the greedy to relinquish their attachment to wealth and status in favor of inner contentment and virtue. He likens the feverish desire for wealth to a debilitating illness, wherein the pursuit of riches only leads to greater suffering and discontent. Epictetus urges individuals to cultivate a sense of detachment from material possessions, recognizing that true fulfillment lies not in external wealth but in the cultivation of moral character and inner peace. Ambrose of Milan's exegesis on Naboth offers a profound reflection on the ethical implications of wealth and property ownership. By asserting that the earth belongs to everyone, not just the wealthy few, Ambrose emphasizes the universal right to access resources and the shared responsibility to ensure equitable distribution. This sentiment is echoed by Pope Paul VI, who interprets Ambrose's words as a reminder of the inherent interconnectedness of humanity and the imperative to prioritize communal well-being over individual accumulation. Ambrose's belief in the fundamental importance of concern for others as the linchpin of society speaks to the ethical foundation of his worldview. He contends that genuine human solidarity, rooted in empathy and compassion, is the glue that binds communities together and fosters a sense of mutual care and responsibility. In contrast, avarice, or greed, is portrayed as a corrosive force that erodes this bond, leading individuals to prioritize self-interest at the expense of the common good. This ethical stance resonates with broader themes in Christian theology, which emphasizes the values of charity, justice, and stewardship of resources. 
The teachings of Laozi, Sunzi, Yang Zhu, and Mencius offer diverse perspectives on the nature of greed and its implications for individual behavior and societal harmony. Laozi, the revered figure in Taoism, cautioned against the relentless pursuit of profit at the expense of social order and well-being. In the Tao Te Ching, Laozi observes that the accumulation of material wealth leads to greater disorder within the state and clan suggesting that excessive desire for profit undermines the cohesion and stability of society. In contrast, Sunzi took a more pessimistic view of human nature, positing that selfishness and greed were inherent traits that must be suppressed through strict laws and regulations. This perspective laid the foundation for legalism, a philosophy that prioritized centralized control and punitive measures to maintain social order and stability. The philosopher Yang Zhu, however, embraced a philosophy of total self-interest, advocating for individual well-being above all else. While not explicitly endorsing greed, Yangism emphasized a form of hedonism wherein personal satisfaction and fulfillment were paramount. Mencius, on the other hand, espoused a belief in the innate goodness of human nature but recognized the potential for greed to disrupt social harmony. He cautioned against prioritizing profit over righteousness warning that the relentless pursuit of material gain would inevitably lead to conflict and strife within society. St. Augustine's reflection on greed offers a profound insight into the moral dimensions of desire and attachment to material wealth. By asserting that greed stems not from the intrinsic value of gold itself, but from the flawed disposition of the individual who pursues it, Augustine underscores the spiritual peril inherent in the misplaced love of temporal goods. Building upon Augustine's teachings, St. Thomas Aquinas further elucidates the theological implications of greed. Aquinas categorizes greed as a sin against God, akin to other mortal sins, insofar as it involves the prioritization of temporal goods over eternal ones. He emphasizes the inherently selfish nature of greed, noting that the accumulation of external riches often comes at the expense of others who are deprived of their fair share. Geoffrey Chaucer's portrayal of greed in The Pardoner's Tale offers a nuanced exploration of the corrupting influence of avarice within the context of medieval society. In the prologue to the tale, Chaucer famously declares radix malorum est cupiditus, underscoring the biblical admonition that greed is the root of all evil. This phrase encapsulates a central theme of the narrative, highlighting the destructive power of excessive desire for wealth and material gain. However, the irony lies in the fact that the pardoner himself, a clergyman tasked with pardoning sins and preaching against greed, serves as a caricature of churchly greed. Despite his moralizing rhetoric, the pardoner is depicted as a hypocrite who exploits the fears and weaknesses of others for his own financial gain. His shameless manipulation of religious piety for personal enrichment underscores the perversion of spiritual values in a society rife with corruption and moral decay. Chaucer's portrayal of the pardoner exposes the hypocrisy and moral ambiguity inherent in the medieval church, reflecting broader concerns about the ethical integrity of religious institutions. In Dante's depiction of hell in the inferno, the punishment for the sin of greed is fittingly severe, befitting its classification as one of the deadly sins. Those condemned to the fourth circle of hell, inhabited by misers, hoarders, and spendthrifts, are forced to battle one another endlessly. This eternal conflict symbolizes the self-destructive nature of greed, where individuals are consumed by their insatiable desire for wealth and possessions, even to the detriment of their own well-being. The souls in this circle of hell have become so consumed by their greed that they have lost their sense of self and identity. Virgil, the guiding spirit, explains to Dante that their obsession with material wealth has rendered them dark and indiscernible to others. This imagery reinforces the idea that greed not only corrupts the soul but also erases one's humanity, leaving behind only a hollow shell consumed by desire. In contrast, Dante's depiction of purgatory offers a glimpse of redemption for those who repent for their sins, including greed. Avaricious penitents are bound and laid face down on the ground, symbolizing their humility and contrition for having focused too much on earthly thoughts and possessions. Through their penance and purification, these souls strive to overcome their attachment to material wealth and ascend to higher levels of spiritual enlightenment. Martin Luther vehemently condemned the greed of usurers, equating them to one of the greatest enemies of humanity, second only to the devil himself. 
In Luther's view, usurers seek to wield power over others by exploiting their financial vulnerability, demonstrating a callous disregard for the suffering and needs of their fellow human beings. He likened usury to a monstrous werewolf, devouring everything in its path while masquerading as a pious and respectable figure. Michel de Montaigne, on the other hand, offered a more nuanced perspective on greed, suggesting that abundance rather than poverty is the true breeding ground for avarice. He observed that those who possess great wealth often become consumed by the desire for even more, leading to a perpetual cycle of acquisition and discontent. Montaigne's reflection underscores the folly of equating material wealth with happiness and fulfillment, highlighting the emptiness of endless accumulation without purpose or moderation. Baruch Spinoza explored the complexities of human desire and the pursuit of wealth, distinguishing between those who seek money for the sake of ostentatious display and those who use it judiciously to meet their genuine needs. He acknowledged the pervasive influence of money-making activities in society, but cautioned against equating this preoccupation with greed. Spinoza argued that true contentment lies in living modestly and in harmony with one's actual needs, rather than succumbing to the allure of excessive wealth and material possessions. John Locke's perspective on property ownership reflects his belief in the importance of labor and establishing rightful ownership. According to Locke, property becomes legitimate through the labor exerted by an individual to improve or cultivate it. He argues that in use property is wasteful and unjust because it deprives others of the opportunity to benefit from its use. In Lawrence Stern's novel Tristram Shandy, the character of Uncle Toby's insatiable desire for knowledge serves as a metaphor for the relentless pursuit of intellectual enrichment. Stern suggests that the acquisition of knowledge, much like the accumulation of wealth, only intensifies one's thirst for more. Uncle Toby's passion for understanding fortifications exemplifies the human tendency to become increasingly absorbed in a particular pursuit, leading to a perpetual cycle of craving and gratification. Jean-Jacques Rousseau contrasts the natural simplicity of man in a state of nature with the artificial desires and insatiable cravings of civilized society. He argues that as societies evolve, Individuals become consumed by their desires for wealth, power, and possessions, leading to a relentless pursuit of self-interest at the expense of others. Adam Smith, a prominent political economist, distinguishes between the limited desire for food and the boundless pursuit of other goods and luxuries. He suggests that while individuals may have finite appetites for basic necessities like food, their desire for material comforts and status symbols knows no bounds. Edward Gibbon's account of the sack of Rome underscores the universal nature of avarice and the allure of wealth in human societies. He observes that the pillage of Rome was driven by the insatiable greed of the invaders, who prioritized the acquisition of valuable treasures and possessions. John Stuart Mill's analysis of the love of money delves into the complexities of human desires and motivations. He observes that while money is often pursued as a means to achieve various ends, such as happiness or security, it can also become an end in itself. Mill contends that the desire to possess money can surpass the desire to actually utilize it for specific purposes. Moreover, he notes that this desire for money tends to intensify over time, even as other desires that money might fulfill diminish. In Mill's view, money transcends its role as a mere instrument for achieving happiness. It becomes an integral part of an individual's conception of happiness itself. Similarly, he argues that other coveted objectives in life, such as power or fame, may also acquire intrinsic value in the eyes of individuals, independent of any happiness they might bring. Unlike money, however, these objectives may offer some immediate pleasure or gratification, which contributes to their allure. In Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust, the themes of greed and the consequences of living beyond one's means are woven throughout the tragic narrative. Mephistopheles, Disguised as a starving man, confronts Faust, who is in disguise as Plutus, to caution him about the perils of avarice. Through the character of Starveling, Mephistopheles recounts a cautionary tale of avaricia, highlighting the destructive nature of insatiable greed and the pitfalls of excessive consumption. As the play progresses, Faust himself becomes ensnared in the pursuit of worldly pleasures and material wealth. Despite his initial aspirations for knowledge and power, Faust finds himself increasingly drawn to the allure of earthly delights and the promise of limitless desires fulfilled. 
However, as Faust accumulates wealth and experiences, he begins to realize the emptiness and dissatisfaction that accompany his newfound prosperity. In a moment of reflection and self-awareness near the end of the play, Faust acknowledges the profound irony of his situation. Despite his wealth and worldly success, Faust confesses to Mephistopheles that the greatest suffering lies in the feeling of lacking something, even when seemingly everything is within his grasp. This realization encapsulates the tragic essence of Faust's journey, as he grapples with the existential emptiness and spiritual impoverishment that accompany his pursuit of material gain. Through Faust's confession, Goethe highlights the inherent contradictions and moral ambiguities of human desire and ambition. Despite his outward prosperity, Faust is ultimately haunted by a sense of inner emptiness and existential longing, underscoring the futility of seeking fulfillment through external possessions and worldly achievements. In this way, Goethe's Faust serves as a timeless cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked ambition and the pursuit of wealth at the expense of one's soul. Marx's analysis of capitalism delves into the psychology of the capitalist and the underlying motivations that drive the capitalist system. He argues that avarice and the desire for accumulation are foundational to the capitalist mindset, as individuals within the capitalist mode of production are driven by the relentless pursuit of profit. According to Marx, the capitalist is consumed by a Faustian conflict between the passion for accumulating wealth and the desire to enjoy the fruits of that wealth. This internal struggle reflects the tension between the capitalist's drive for profit-making and the human desire for personal fulfillment and enjoyment. Despite this conflict, Marx asserts that the primary aim of the capitalist is not the acquisition of use values or the profit from individual transactions, but rather the perpetual process of profit-making itself. Marx draws parallels between the capitalist and the miser, noting that both are driven by a boundless greed for riches. However, he distinguishes between the two by characterizing the capitalist as a rational miser. While the miser hoards money in a futile attempt to increase its exchange value, the capitalist achieves this goal through the constant reinvestment of capital into the circulation process. In Marx's view, the capitalist's relentless pursuit of exchange value fuels the endless cycle of capitalist accumulation, driving the expansion of capital and the intensification of economic exploitation. This insatiable greed for profit lies at the heart of capitalist society, shaping its dynamics and perpetuating its contradictions. David Clem's interpretation of Augustine highlights the danger of becoming attached to earthly possessions and desires. He suggests that many individuals become possessed by their objects of desire, leading to a sense of neediness and dependency. Clem characterizes this attachment as a form of window shopping of the soul wherein individuals lose themselves in shallow and ultimately unfulfilling goods. However, Clem also emphasizes Augustine's perspective on the proper use of private property. According to Augustine, those who utilize their possessions for the purpose of enjoying a relationship with God are able to detach themselves from their goods. By doing so, they are able to possess their possessions well, transcending the trap of greed and materialism. Greed has long been a theme explored in literature and film, serving as a central motif in many works of fiction and cinema. In literature, authors often use greed as a driving force behind the actions of characters, exploring its consequences on both individuals and society. Classic novels, such as Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, and F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, delve into the destructive nature of greed and its impact on human relationships and morality. Movies such as Wall Street, There Will Be Blood, and The Wolf of Wall Street offer nuanced portrayals of characters consumed by their desires for wealth and power, illustrating the corrupting influence of greed on the human psyche. In the field of psychology, greed is studied as a complex human behavior influenced by a variety of factors, including personality traits, upbringing, and societal norms. Psychologists seek to understand the underlying motivations and psychological mechanisms driving greedy behavior, exploring its relationship to concepts such as materialism, narcissism, and impulsivity. Additionally, behavioral economics examines how individuals make decisions related to greed and self-interest, studying phenomena such as loss aversion, risk-taking, and irrational decision-making in the pursuit of wealth and possessions. Greed also has significant social and cultural implications, shaping societal values 
norms, and institutions. Conversely, acts of generosity and altruism serve as antidotes to greed, promoting empathy, compassion, and social cohesion. Initiatives aimed at addressing greed and promoting ethical behavior, such as corporate social responsibility programs and philanthropic endeavors, play a crucial role in fostering a more equitable and sustainable society. Throughout history, mammon has been a potent symbol representing the allure and dangers of material wealth. In both religious and secular contexts, mammon is depicted as a deity or force that tempts individuals to prioritize worldly possessions over spiritual or moral values. In the New Testament, mammon is notably referenced by Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, where he warns against the worship of wealth at the expense of devotion to God. The phrase you cannot serve both God and mammon underscores the inherent conflict between spiritual fulfillment and the pursuit of material gain. In Hebrew, mammon simply means money, but its symbolic significance extends beyond mere currency to encompass the broader concept of wealth and material possessions. The concept of mammon as a personification of wealth and greed persisted throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. In the 4th century, theologians such as Cyprian, Jerome, and John Chrysostom associated mammon with the sin of greed, portraying it as an evil master that enslaves individuals. Peter Lombard, a theologian of the 12th century, referred to mammon as a devil, emphasizing the spiritual dangers associated with wealth. Piers Plowman, a Middle English allegorical narrative poem, also depicted mammon as a deity, highlighting its role as a false idol worshipped by those consumed by greed. Although some scholars, like Albert Barnes, have suggested that mammon was a Syriac word for an idol worshipped as the god of riches, no historical evidence supports this claim. Instead, Literary references in works like Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen and John Milton's Paradise Lost further popularize the idea of mammon as a symbol of covetousness and materialism. In later occultist writings, such as Shock Colin de Plansy's Dictionnaire Inferno, mammon is depicted as Hell's ambassador to England, reflecting the association between wealth and spiritual corruption. Moreover, Thomas Carlyle in past and present used the term gospel of mammonism as a metaphor for the materialistic ethos prevalent in the 19th century. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the term mammon gained renewed significance in American discourse, particularly within the context of the social gospel movement. This movement, which emerged within Protestant Christianity, emphasized social justice, economic equality, and the moral imperative to address poverty and inequality. Populists, progressives, and muckrakers during this period utilized the concept of mammon to critique the consolidated wealth and power of banking and corporate institutions, particularly those headquartered on Wall Street. These critics viewed mammon as a symbol of greed, exploitation, and unchecked capitalism, representing the oppressive forces that perpetuated economic inequality and social injustice. The social gospel movement sought to challenge the influence of mammon by advocating for policies and reforms aimed at promoting economic fairness, worker rights, and social welfare. Leaders and activists within this movement invoked religious teachings to condemn the idolatry of wealth and to call for a more just and compassionate society. In this context, mammon became synonymous with the corrosive effects of unrestrained greed and the moral bankruptcy of economic exploitation. By linking mammon to the excesses of Wall Street and corporate capitalism, reformers sought to mobilize public opinion against the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a privileged few, advocating for policies that would promote greater economic opportunity and social equity for all members of society. Greed, in its essence, is not merely about accumulating wealth or possessions, but rather about the excessive desire and attachment to them. It becomes harmful when it leads individuals to prioritize material gain above all else, disregarding the well-being of others and even their own spiritual or moral values. When individuals become obsessed with accumulating wealth to the detriment of others, it can result in exploitation, injustice, and harm to society as a whole. Moreover, the relentless pursuit of wealth often leads to discontentment, isolation, and spiritual emptiness ultimately undermining the individual's well-being and happiness. Therefore, warnings against greed serve as reminders to cultivate virtues such as moderation, generosity, and compassion. By recognizing the dangers of excessive attachment to wealth and possessions, 
individuals can strive for a more balanced and fulfilling life that prioritizes the welfare of others and the pursuit of higher ideals beyond material gain.